Last time, we talked about two major topics in kinetics. One, the first one, was rate-limiting steps, which is the idea that no matter how complicated your mechanism may be, and this is a very complicated one, obviously, if there's some choke point or um, bottleneck step in the midst of the reaction, and if everything before that is fast and everything after that is fast, then the overall rate of production of the final product is going to be controlled primarily by that slow step. If that slow step is 100 times slower, say, than everything else, then at the end, the rate of production of K will be as if that were really the only step in the whole overall reaction. Everything else happens so fast that it just doesn't take any time. There's going to be a great big buildup of concentration on D. All the, pro all the intermediates beyond D will be in low concentration because they're all destroyed just as soon as they're created. And you'll be able to understand what's going on even in this very complicated mechanism just by, mainly anyway, by looking at just that slow step. Let me make another comment too, and that is that what's really going on on the microscopic scale is always complicated like this. We draw mechanisms that have, you know, four or five steps, and those are good enough for our purposes, for understanding an overall mechanism, overall reaction. But what's really going on microscopically probably always has hundreds of steps. And so if this weren't true, if it weren't true that a few steps were, were the only things necessary to understand what was going on, we couldn't understand what was going on at all. The, the, the presence of rate-determining steps is really actually very important for our ability to understand chemical reactions generally. All right. We also talked about the steady-state approximation. There isn't as much in the way of fundamental concepts behind that, but it is a very useful procedure. There are a number of homework problems that have been assigned, and practice exam, practice final exam questions that have been uh, put in in order to exercise the steady state approximation because it's very useful. We did one large example of that. So just to summarize, the steady state approximation amounts to setting all of the rate equations for all of the intermediates in the mechanism to zero on the assumption that they're never present in very high concentrations and that they also tend to have very steady concentrations over time because they're created, they're destroyed as soon as they're created. And we did a big example of that last time with, for the overall reaction H2 plus I2 goes to 2HI, and that's a nice example. Let me, let's go back to it because you end up with a pretty complicated result. Here it is. That's a pretty complicated rate law, not even a power law and half orders and all kinds of stuff, negative powers and everything, if you want to think of it that way. And yet, it wasn't too bad to, uh, to derive that using the steady-state approximation. And that's generally true. The steady-state approximation really simplifies the analysis, even of relatively complicated mechanisms. That's what makes it useful. That's what makes it so common. Now we're going to talk about, go to the next topic, which is understanding branched mechanisms. Let's come back over here to do that. A branched mechanism is any mechanism that involves a step like this, where there's, some, I mean, this, a lot of stuff may have come before here, but when we get to A, suddenly two possible routes open up. There's two possible products for the same initial reactant, A here. And two different rate constants, one for each branch in the mechanism, <coughs> which can also be written this way, right? A goes to B, and A can also go to C with two different rate constants. <coughs> it's oftentimes good to take a, a mechanism that looks like this in sort of diagrammatic form and write it out formally as a list of elementary reactions. That oftentimes clarifies things. And the main question for this mechanism, this little simple mechanism, is then if you've got this choice of either B or C with, two, with you know, a certain rate at which B is produced, a certain rate at which C is produced, then how much B do you get? How much C do you get? For a given amount of A, for a given initial amount of A, how much B do you get? How much C do you get? And that, that has lots of implications for, in, in practical settings for if you're setting out to do some kind of, 
kind of chemical synthesis, but there are side reactions, right? This is, this is the classic case where there are side reactions. C could be a side reaction here, or it could be a whole bunch of different side reactions, representing that as just one thing. And this could be the product that you actually want. Well, what's your percent yield going to be? Are you going to get a lot of B and very little C? That's what you'd like, but it could easily end up the other way, right? You could get lots of side stuff, lots of crap, and very little of what you want, and you want to set up experimental conditions that maximize the good stuff and minimize the side reactions. All right, if we go through the equation, the rate equations for this case, then there are three of them. There are three species, A, B, and C. For A, it can go away by either branch, right? K1 or K2, branch 1 or branch 2. So it's going away at a rate that's equal to the sum of the rate constants or controlled by the sum of the rate constants <coughs> for both branches at once. On the other hand, B builds up only because of branch 1 and C builds up only because of branch 2. I won't go through the business of solving these. They aren't t terribly hard to solve, but you can. Uh, and you can do that. I, I suggest uh, that as an exercise, actually, for people, because it's a good mm, exercise. If you, can, if you don't get stuck, then you're in good shape. Uh, if you do get stuck, well, I won't ask for solving differential equations on the final, so you don't have to be able to do it. But it's a very good exercise if you can. If you can do it, you're in good shape. All right, here's the solutions <clears throat> for A, for B, for C. Because all these reactions are irreversible, as usual for, these, for this case, we haven't done any reversible cases yet, that's below, um, the A goes away as if B and C weren't there, but with a rate constant that's equal to both rate, both rate constants at once, and so it's going to behave like a first-order decay with a time constant, for example, or a half-life, that's just equal to the log of 2 over k1 plus k2, right? The effective rate constant is k1 plus k2 now, so whatever the effective rate constant is goes underneath there, and you can calculate the half-life for the decay of A. That makes sense. And then B and C build up also with the same time constant. These are not decays, right? These are build-ups. We can look at the graph down here to see that a little better. Here's A decaying away exponentially. Here's B and C building up exponentially. And they both build up with the same exponential function. But as time goes to infinity, if, t if this goes to infinity and that goes to infinity, then these exponential terms go to zero, right? And the final results that you get, the final amount of B and C, will just be this first term, right? That one is the only thing that will survive. And when you multiply that by this, you'll get that A infin B infinity here, let me go over to this side. At infinity, the concentration of B will be just this first term, just this leading term here which is k1 divided by k1 plus k2, and c will be k2 divided by k1 plus k2. And you can see that what this is is just the fraction of the total rate constant, k1 plus k2, that is, rep that is represented by k1. And the same thing down here, the fraction of the total rate constant that's represented by k2 times however much a0 you had to start with. and so. The amount of B you get at the end and the amount of C you get at the end depends on what fraction of the total represents K1 and what fraction represents K2. And another way to put the same thing a little bit simpler is that if I take the ratio of these two guys, then I'm, this denominator is going to divide out, the A0s are going to divide out, and I'm just going to get K1 over K2. So the ratio of B that you get at the end to the amount of C that you get at the end is just the ratio of the two rate constants for the two branches in the branched mechanism. So you can tell, if you know these rate constants, you can tell right away how much B you're going to get and how much C you're going to get. If K is 10 times faster than K1 is 10 times faster than K2, then you're going to get 10 times more B than you get of C. On the other hand, if it's the other way around, if K2 is 10 times faster than K1, 
then you're going to get 10 times as much C as you do B. That's relevant to percent yield sort of calculations and considerations in a chemical synthesis, especially because oftentimes when you're carrying out a chemical synthesis, there's a whole bunch of side reactions. You set things up with one reaction in mind, but a whole bunch of other things that you didn't have in mind happen anyway. And now what I've done in this picture is I've replaced C here with a whole bunch of these side products, P2, P3, and so on. We don't know what those are necessarily. We don't care what they are. What we really care is that the collective sum of all the rate constants that's producing them all. You can see from the logic of what we just did above that the amount of B that you get at, an, at the end to the amount of other stuff is just going to be the ratio of the rate constant for the stuff we want to the sum of all the rate constants for all the stuff we don't want. And so as long as all of these rates are collectively slow, we're going to get mostly B which is presumably what we want. But if the sum of all these guys adds up to something that's bigger than B, and especially if it's a lot bigger than B, then you're going to get mostly junk that you don't want and very little of what you do want. So shutting down all these side reactions, making the rate constants for all those side reactions below, that's a big part of the business of carrying out a successful synthesis for some product that you want. All right. That brings us to the second topic for this lecture, which is reversible reactions. There's not a whole lot of complication in this case. So first of all, let me just say, here's what a reversible reaction is. It's something with a back reaction, right? So far, every case we've considered only had a forward reaction. Those are irreversible. If you've got a back reaction, then it's a reversible reaction. Here's what it looks like written out as a series of uh, elementary reactions like we should properly do every time. The importance of this case isn't so much in the mathematics. It's that this is the first time we've had the possibility of reaching equilibrium. If you've got an irreversible reaction, as I've said early in earlier lectures, if your rea reactions are irreversible, you can't come to equilibrium. You've got to have a back reaction in order to come to equilibrium. And uh, the fact is that every single elementary reaction, this one is the simplest one, but any others that we may have, does have a reversible reaction. That's the principle of microscopic reversibility. There is no physical process that can't be turned around and run backwards. And that means since an elementary reaction is a reversible, is a, is, an, is a physical process, it will be reversible. There will be a back reaction. However, the two rate constants for the forward reaction, K1 or K forward, as it's often called, K minus 1 or K reverse, as it's often called, are not the same. The forward rate may be much faster than the backward rate. If that's so, then for a lot of practical purposes, we can ignore that backward reaction. And that's what we really mean by an irreversible reaction. No reaction is truly irreversible. There's always some rate at which you can go backwards. But that rate may be thousands of times slower than the forward rate, or even millions of times slower than the forward rate. And in that case, for a lot of purposes, it's often fine, and in fact, uh, useful to just ignore that backward reaction. But they all, every single elementary reaction, every single elementary process of any kind, whether it be a chemical reaction or anything else, has a backwards reversible step. All right, that's again, that's the principle of microscopic reversibility. All right, that is the, the idea of microscopic reversibility is necessary for there to be equilibrium. And since every chemical reaction comes to equilibrium, there must be a backward step. That's one point. That's the main point so far. But it's also true that if that's true, then 
if we have proper, a proper theory for kinetics, for time-dependent behavior, then by waiting long enough, waiting for time to go to infinity, all of our concentrations must go to equilibrium concentrations. And that means that our kinetic theory must be able to predict the equilibrium concentrations as well, and that means that it must connect very strongly, it must predict all of thermodynamics and all of equilibrium statistical mechanics as well. So this theory that we're working on so far and we're just really starting with, I, I told you that it's a special case or a, 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 an example of something called non-equilibrium statmech statistical mechanics, this is a, a, an implication of that fact. Non-equilibrium statistical mechanics must include equilibrium statistical mechanics as a special case. And for the same reasons, chemical kinetics must also include equilibrium as a special case. So there must be a very strong connection between the stuff we're talking about now, chemical kinetics, and all the stuff we talked about th for the whole rest of the semester. We haven't made that connection yet, and we're never really going to make that connection as strongly as it should be made because it's kind of complicated. But we'll at least begin. We'll make a, the, the core of that connection just in a minute here. All right. Before we do that, though, let's go through the math for this case. We have this two-step uh, reversible uh, simple mechanism. There are accordingly, there's two species, and so there are accordingly two rate equations. Neither of them is an intermediate in this case, so we can go about solving them, and if we do, again, I won't go through the differential equations business. Again, it's a good exercise to go through it if you want. Then we get the following two expressions, one for A, one for B, you can see that there's an exponentially decaying function, but it's not as simple as in the other cases. The, the, the A concentration doesn't decay away to zero. When T goes to infinity here, this term goes to zero, in fact, but there's a leftover term or a, another term here that doesn't go to zero, and that means the A concentration doesn't go to zero. Likewise, over here in B, this term will go to zero as T goes to infinity, but this first term here, and the K1 multiplying it don't go to zero, and so B doesn't go to zero either. Neither of them goes to zero now. And that's what you'd expect, right? They're going to equilibrium instead, and equilibrium concentrations aren't zero necessarily. In fact, they're never truly zero. Here's some plots showing what those functions look like or those expressions look like when we uh, plot them versus time. And you can see, like I said, that they, the A concentration goes to some concentration at infinite time, which has to be the same thing as the equilibrium concentration for A, and likewise B starting from zero here, I'm assuming here that there was only A to start with and there was zero B to start with. Anyway, the B is created and, and rises uh, with an exponential rise to some infinite time concentration, which is the same thing as the equilibrium concentration. And if you look at these expressions, I have this down here, right? If I set this time equal to zero or equal to infinity, if this time goes to infinity, then this term goes to zero. You can see that that's going to leave this stuff left over at infinite time, and that's what I've written over here. And likewise here, this stuff is going to be left over at infinite time, and that's what I've written here. And so we can predict, or these expressions, as I said earlier, the kinetics must be able to predict the equilibrium concentrations, and that's what we're seeing here. The kinetics is predicting the equilibrium concentrations. The equilibrium concentration for A in this case has to be equal to the reverse rate constant divided by the sum of the forward and reverse rate constants, and the equilibrium concentration for B has to equal the forward rate constant divided by the sum of the forward and reverse rate constants. These expressions may not look familiar to you. You may be saying to yourself, What's, how is that related to the equilibrium concentrations that we would have gotten if we approached this problem from 
the point of view of thermodynamics rather than kinetics. But let me assure you, if you go through it, and I, I, I encourage people to, to go through it, if you were to calculate the equilibrium concentrations for A and B for this reaction, you would get these very same expressions. And so the kinetics is predicting the correct equilibrium concentrations for this very simple uh, first order forward and first order reverse mechanism. The reason we can say that is the following. Let's suppose we take the ratio of these two guys, the ratio of the B concentration at infinity over the A concentration at infinity. You can see from these expressions here that that's just equal to the ratio of the forward rate constant over the backward rate constant, and that makes sense, right? A goes to B, B is created with rate 1, but B goes to A, A is back created with rate minus 1, and so it makes sense that the ratio of B you get at the end over the, ratio, the, the amount of A that you get at the, end, at the end should be the ratio of the rate at which B was created to the rate at which A is created, and so this ratio of rate constants controlling the ratio of, concentra of equilibrium concentrations makes sense. But from thermodynamics, we already also know that the equilibrium concentration of B over the equilibrium concentration of A really should be activity of B, right, and activity of A, but all right, we'll say that activities are concentrations for now. That ratio has to be equal to the equilibrium constant, the thermodynamic equilibrium constant for the reaction. And that equilibrium constant has to be related to the delta G of reaction for that reaction, for that uh, simple reaction. And so you can see this relationship must hold. It must be true at all times at equilibrium that the ratio of the forward to the reverse rate constants, this is kinetics over on this side, has to equal the thermodynamic equilibrium constant, and that's thermodynamics and stat mech, equilibrium stat mech on the other side. So this is the connection between non-equilibrium behavior and equilibrium behavior. It looks really simple. It looks almost trivial. Probably a lot of you knew this relationship already. But it's so important that it has its own special name. It's called the principle of detail balance. And extended and amplified to all of its implications throughout the whole world, throughout the whole world of physics and the world surrounding us, it has an enormous number of implications and applications. And I, we just won't have time this semester to go into it, but suffice it to say that, <clears throat> um, that this is an enormously important result. The principle of detailed balance shows up over and over and over again in many fields, in many places, in many applications. All right. Uh, I guess there's a few more things I want to say before we end. The first is that I, I wrote down the principle of detailed balance here for a very simple reversible reaction, but it applies to every, uh, every kind of elementary reaction. With the caveat that K1 over K minus 1 equals KEQ, so long as these two forward and reverse reactants Rea uh, rate constants are for the same elementary reaction, right? Can't, be, can't mix two rate constants from two different reactions here. Then it's always true, no matter what kind of reaction it is, no matter what the reactants and products are, that the ratio of the forward to the backward rate constants is equal to the equilibrium constant. Now, there is a slight issue here. We'll see that. We'll encounter that later when we do an example in the next lecture. But the rate constants, if this is a second-order reaction, for example, like if this is elementary, then this is a second-order reaction going forward, but only a first-order reaction going backwards, right? And that means these Ks don't have the same units, and that means that if we take the ratio, we won't get something that's unitless. We'll get an e equilibrium constant that's actually got units, and that's 
in disagreement with everything we said during the uh, thermodynamics section, and the answer or the, the solution to that conundrum is that these the concentrations really should be activities. That means these rate constants really shouldn't have units. Suffice it to say that when you get when you, you get units like seconds to the minus one or molar to the minus one seconds to the minus one for a second order uh, rate constant, then you're really choosing your um, standard state for the reaction. And what you should really do is just ignore the units, treat the equilibrium, con the equilibrium constant as if it were an equilibrium constant for the standard states that are consistent with the units, and then everything will be fine. So you get, I mean, uh, thermodynamics and kinetics are full of these units conundrums because there's a, there's a bunch of subtleties going on here that we don't like to dwell on too long. But suffice it to say that if you get units from this ratio, what that's really telling you is what the standard states are. They're usually one molar standard states, and you should just treat the equilibrium constant you get as being equivalent to a thermodynamic equilibrium constant or a stat mech equilibrium constant for that standard state. All right, with that, I think we are done. The next topic is to talk about the theory for rate constants themselves, but that's another big topic in its own right, so we'll stop there.